Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to a book forum with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm Kent Lastman, and for the next hour, I'll be your guide for a conversation with the authors of two recent books that can teach us a lot about how to think about threats to society, risk, and the future. My first guest is Dr. Patrick Moore. He's an ecologist, a co-founder of Greenpeace, a longtime activist, as well as a board member with our friends at the CO2 Coalition. His new book is Fake, Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. We're also joined by Johan Norberg. Johan is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, author and documentarian and winner of, the, of CEI's 2019 Julian L. Simon Memorial Award. He is with us today to talk about his latest book, Open, the Story of Human Progress. It's been shortlisted by the Manhattan Institute for the Hayek Prize and was named among the best books of the year by The Economist. Now, I think quite possibly we could spend hours walking through each book, the evidence that they marshal and the arguments that are presented, but I'm not going to do your homework for you. And that's because I want each of you, each member of this audience to buy and then read these books. I promise you they are worth it. Instead, much of our conversation is going to focus on the themes that recur again and again, risk, social cohesion, progress, and threats. Some of this material will challenge you and all of it invites more discussion and more investigation. And to that end, I ask you to please submit your questions. I'll be monitoring a queue. It comes in via the Q and A function that you see at the bottom of your screen or by sending an email to events at cei.org. As a quick reminder for everyone, the program's being recorded and will be available at our website at cei.org and on YouTube. And secondly, at the end of the hour, I'm going to ask for your input and feedback via a short 90 second survey. This survey helps us shape the programming at CEI and bring you good, informative and thoughtful programs. So let's get to the heart of things and begin with Patrick. First of all, thank you for being with us. Can you tell us about your new book and in particular, explain what motivates the skepticism that you bring to the received wisdom on the environmental calamities that we see reported day after day and year after year. Patrick? Yes. The floor is yours. Tell us about your book. My book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, uh, it dawned on me after I've been studying environment for over 50 years, since I was a kid, really. And it dawned on me that almost all the scare stories about the environment and the earth are based on things that are either invisible, like carbon dioxide, radiation, and whatever is supposed to be bad in GMOs, or really remote, like polar bears and coral reefs, so that nobody can verify these claims of doom and catastrophe for themselves, because you can't go to the North Pole and count all the polar bears yourself. You can't go to the Great Barrier Reef and dive on the whole thing, which is like half the size of the United States practically. And you can't see carbon dioxide over there and, and say, look what bad things it's doing. So we depend exclusively on the activists, the media, the politicians, and the scientists on serial government grants to tell us the truth about these things when in fact they have a huge financial and political interest in the public believing their scare stories because that is how they are making a living, how they're getting donations and advertising revenue and science grants and votes. So it's completely rigged in terms of being based on things that people can't verify. The, the discovery, the first point in discovery is observation in science and then verification through replication. And it's as simple as that. I mean, methodology is a, another whole area, but basically science is about seeing is believing and then seeing that happen over and over again under the same circumstances, counting the polar bears one year and then the next and then the next and getting a pattern. We know they are growing in population rapidly over the last 50 years and we're being told they're going extinct. We know the Great Barrier Reef is in a straight of state of great health, but they're saying it's dying. Well, of course, some corals are dying every year. 
people forget that living things all die, individuals that is, but then new ones are born. And so they're emphasizing the death and forgetting about the being born part of coral reefs and polar bears and many other uh, living species. And it, the book is not just about living species, it's also about radiation and nuclear energy. But just an example with GMOs, apparently there's something bad in GMOs that is going to hurt us. Well, first, billions of meals have been eaten by hundreds of millions of people, and there's never been a single complaint of any ailment whatsoever from eating genetically modified foods. Secondly, it's obviously something invisible because they can't show it to us on, on their hand or even with a 10 million times electron microscope. But the clincher is it doesn't have a name and it doesn't have a chemical formula. And everything has a chemical formula, whether it's an element or a molecule, it has to be something real. And so the conclusion is there is nothing in GMOs that is harmful. Otherwise they would be able to name what it is. And that's 11 chapters in my book all come to similarly convincing conclusions because when you realize that it's a scare story about something invisible or remote, it isn't that hard to peel off the facade because they are actually, they're actually so fake that it's not difficult to show that once you analyze it carefully. Thank you for that. I, uh, I forgot at this top here, I like to show the books so that when the audience goes to buy them, they know what they're looking for at the bookshop. So uh, here's Patrick's book. Uh, and let me turn now and, and get Johan into the conversation. We have his book uh, open. Uh, first of all, a hearty welcome back to the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, Patrick illustrate, illustrates these stories, uh, oftentimes from the past 50 years, and his data sets, they're pulled from the millennia. Uh, they really, I think, uh, tie in nicely with your investigation of openness and how it relates to the store of knowledge and how that has been built over time. Uh, I read through your book and it was like a tour of civilizational highlights from all around the world in every single era. Could you start by just sharing the story of how this book follows on your previous work progress and the, the four core pillars of openness that you uh, investigate and discuss. And here I'm thinking of exchange, open doors, minds, and eventually open societies. Yes, thank you. And thanks for having me back. And it was a pleasure the last time around. Uh, I'm glad we did it before the pandemic so that I really got to go there and get the Memori Union Assignment Memorial Award. I do appreciate it. It's an inspiration all constantly. Um, yes, well, to put my book into uh, the, the Johan Norberg context, I usually write about and talk about progress and why we shouldn't take it for granted because it's a precious and rare thing in history. The fact that we see rapid growth of scientific knowledge, technological innovation and rapidly rising living standards. This time around, I wanted to do well, if progress and those kinds of works are like the classical Star Wars trilogy, uh, the here and now of the battles between the Empire and the rebels, this is a prequel and a sequel. It tells what happened before and what might happen later on. Uh, but hopefully they're more in, in style of the classical trilogy, I think, when it comes to quality, at least I hope. Um, so what I'm trying to explain is why do we get this progress and why it's based on openness? Uh, if you look at history, the great civilizations, the episodes of efflorescence uh, of scientific, technological and economic growth, which we ha had, uh, they were in civilizations that were relatively open in these four areas, at least relative to what uh, came before it and their neighbors, open to um, exchange and trade so that they borrowed constantly ideas and innovations from other places, open doors. Uh, they were often in, at the cross uh, borders between different civilizations, merchants, missionaries, travelers, uh, adventurers, migrants constantly moving across borders and thereby bringing new 
ideas with which to try to solve the old problems and open uh, minds, openness to new ideas and uh, challenge the status quo, the traditions, the taboos and go wherever facts lead them and open societies. And by that, I mean societies that are works in progress, societies that aren't designed from the top by any kind of Politburo or parliament, uh, but a work in progress created from everybody, or at least as many people as possible who are allowed to experiment with new ideas, new technologies and new business models. So they all, all the successful civilizations historically had something like that, at least relative to, to other cultures. Uh, but the other common denominator was that they also collapsed at one point. And I try to explain that as well, why we're so, why it's so difficult for us to embrace openness and innovation and why we are constantly searching for that kind of stability, that kind of predictability that no kind of progress can ever give us, but we can search for it uh, from the strong men, from the big government or find uh, some sort of set of ideas or religious attitudes that uh, gives us that. And the dark irony, of course, is that, that that undermines the pillars of openness and thereby undermines those societies and those civilizations. As I read through this, uh, these pair of books, um, they're quite different in style and tone, but they shared, um, had they been novels, it seems to me that they both shared a character, uh, like a, a mysterious figure that operates all through the story and is not named until just at the end. And that character is, is fear. Uh, and that's, that is a primary driver uh, behind many of the stories that each of you tell. I, I wonder, um, maybe first, Johan, does fear operate like a contagion? Uh, if I'm afraid, uh, will I make my spouse or neighbor more fearful? Uh, and even does it operate like a parasite? Does it drain me of the ability to think clearly about evidence uh, in, in my skeptical nature about the world? Yes, that's exactly the case. All the attitudes that encourage us to go out there, explore strange new knowledge, to experiment in bizarre ways, according to lots of people, and to build new business models and new adventures. All of that is based on some sort of confidence, some sort of at least hope that whatever you do can create something a better tomorrow. Fear is, it's, it's important. <laughs> we, we need fear, we need bad emotions, because that's the signal that we're in a bad place and that we have to hide, we have to flee, we have to, um, or fight back against the threat that's there. Um, the problem is that we react with this kind of fear to any kind of bad news. Um, we're triggered to do that because historically, evolutionary speaking, any kind of threat could be a threat to our survival. But obviously in a 24 hours uh, news cycle and um, cable news and social media and activist groups telling us about all the bad things that might happen at some place. It triggers this kind of fear. And then we retreat and we start to search for some sort of protection back to the strong man to protect us from doing these things. And that's exactly where we shouldn't go if we want to continue our open-ended um, search for new solutions and a better tomorrow. Now, now Patrick, the, um... These, these twin pillars that you identified when you looked across your career, you, you said uh, things that are distant or difficult to identify and name and, and count and invisible. Uh, it seems to me that fear really plays into the invisible nature of many of the, the threats that we're told about. Um, it, how do we address that? How do we tackle, uh, you know, chemicals? They're hard to they're hard to comprehend because we can't see them and touch them and feel them. Uh, what is it we can do to better help our friends, our neighbors, our society cope with the invisible nature of much of what is around us so that we're not so fearful? Well, first, just to bounce off Johan's point, uh, I, 
I have this little double entendre, hope trumps fear. And I think that sums up the difference between the previous and the present administration. We are living in a time now where the promotion of fear is the primary motivator for people. People are afraid the world is coming to an end because people who are supposedly knowledgeable about what's happening are telling them that. And if they don't do certain things, there will be a terrible disaster and a, a calamity uh, befall the earth, the whole earth. Now, I, I go like, what do you mean the world is coming to an end? What does that look like? Or even, even things like all this, the main species are going extinct. Uh, I was at a, 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 a US House a meeting testifying on extinction. And these guys from the United Nations were there saying that half the species on earth are threatened with imminent extinction if we don't stop doing what we're doing, which is mainly burning fossil fuels. Now that half the species on earth. And on the other, the other hand, they said, well, we know there's 1.7 million species, but we really think there's 8.7 million. And so they actually make up these species that don't even exist. So I said like 2 million species could go extinct tonight and we wouldn't know what had happened because we didn't know they were there in the first place. This is how phony this kind of scare story stuff has become. Like the world is going to end and half the species are gonna die when we don't even know what their names are or what they look like. And this is in front of the US Congress Committee on Water and Wildlife that the United Nations is telling the world this. And it's, it's just so phony. And Mark Morano of Climate Depot and I were there unbeknownst initially uh, to the committee, a Democrat committee, of course, at this point in time in, in the US House. And we gave really good testimony. And they decided to, to pretend that meeting had never occurred, an actual House committee meeting, and scheduled a new committee meeting in front of a different committee two weeks later and didn't invite us back. And that became the official record of this discussion of species extinction. Now, it's, that's not a, a, a small item, species extinction. It's a big thing. If species start going extinct by the hundreds of thousands, we'll know we've done something wrong. But they aren't. There's no evidence of that. And in fact, ever since the passenger pigeon went extinct, which is one of only two species that have gone extinct in the continental United States since Europeans arrived, there's been quite a number go extinct in, for example, Hawaii and other islands because Europeans brought foxes, cats, rats, snakes, and other diseases that didn't exist in those places. And many of the species that were unique to those places could not withstand this new incursion of exotic species. But that was like a pulse that happened once. And now it has tapered off over the last 500 years to where it's not really an issue any longer, and except for some species are still being protected because they are threatened. But it's not an emergency. Species extinction is not an emergency, yet they are making it so at the highest level of world, uh, well, if you want to call it government, but the United Nations, I hope it never does become a government because it'll probably be bureaucrats in Beijing that are at the center of it all. Uh, and that's a whole other subject of, is the fear of basically totalitarianism coming into play even in the Western democracies these days. And so fear, yes, is the, I'd say the prime motivator. It makes, makes you make adrenaline when you're afraid. And when there's a good reason to be afraid, that's a good thing because it gets you more alert and ready to fight. But it's not time to fight uh, in, in these fake and invisible catastrophes that they're telling us about, especially the idea they say we should fight climate change. How do you Look, fight climate change? Let me let me ask you quickly. We got a, our first question in from the audience um, because what you're describing is uh, um, you know a motivating factor for why things get overhyped. Um, and Nancy asks, uh, how do you undo 
the base assumption, the basic assumption that Greenpeace or other organizations are doing good when in fact they're promoting uh, things that are fake doom and gloom. Well, if taking Greenpeace an ex as example, and I was there at the very beginning in 1970-71 uh, for 15 years in the top committee. So I know its history very well. I wrote another book titled Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, The Making of a Sensible Environmentalist on that whole 15 year period. Plus that book contains a chapter on all the relevant environmental subjects today. We started out as a band of volunteers in a church basement in Vancouver, Greenpeace did. And at first it was just noble causes, stopping the threat of nuclear war, saving the whales from extinction, stopping the mass slaughter of nursing harp seals in their breeding grounds, uh, stopping toxic waste from going into the rivers. The rivers of Europe and, and Britain were, were more or less dead right into the late 70s and early 80s because they hadn't passed the kind of legislation we had here in North America, the Clean Air and Water Acts, for example. So we did good things, but eventually we became so successful that people were sending us so much money that we had to hire people to be a staff. And then, then we had 500 people on payroll and pretty soon fundraising became really important. And we were basically now a pretty big business and fundraising took priority over campaigns in some ways and pretty soon they started inventing campaigns like the ban chlorine worldwide campaign and then after I left I watched I saw this coming they basically turned into a racket peddling junk science which is what they are today with their pla toxic plastic campaign and all the other campaigns they have there isn't a single one of them that actually has much validity to it and and they're now part of the whole global economic forum behind the closed doors United Nations effort to bring in globalism. That's, that's where they fit now. I, I wanna keep pushing on this uh, uh, threat and fear theme. And, and Johan, let me ask you about, um, uh, for, our, for our audience, you're joining us from Europe today. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit or ask you a little bit about the precautionary principle. Um, I'm astounded that things like an AstraZeneca vaccine could be withheld or entire societies and cultures could turn away from something that would do good because of an, a pursuit of safe as opposed to more safe alternatives. It, this sort of closing the doors and keeping out products, even life-saving products at a time of a pandemic, um, how has that played out over time? And is that, uh, I would have liked to think that we were done with it, but it clearly we're not, this, uh, this drive toward precaution. Well, it keeps coming back and uh, it rears its ugly head in, in, in new ways constantly. Uh, now this time around with the vaccine, it's one of the, the ugliest versions that I've seen so far. And um, the problem is uh, that the European Union failed when it came to um, uh, procuring a sufficient number of uh, vaccine doses. So they had to find scapegoats. They had to shift the conversation in, in certain ways. And now it came to this thing about the fear that it might be linked, the AstraZeneca vaccine, to blood cloths. And um, the, the problem is that... Uh, there was no data, uh, there was no causal link that had been uh, even indicated so far. We'll see about that. But more than that, the problem is that mortality in COVID-19, according to the data that they used, uh, was around 1%. But mortality from the vaccine, if every single case of mortality from um, blood clots was linked to this vaccine, was 0.0003% or something like that. So it means that if you had a one in 30,000 risk of getting COVID, it's worth it anyway. And, and as a matter of fact, blood cloths, cloths is a, um, a, a sometimes a consequence of COVID-19 as well. So this shows you how the precautionary principle interpreted 
not in a rational way, but just as a way of avoiding risks, leads you completely astray because it just tells you don't take any kind of risk. And it, it doesn't matter if the other risks that you lived in before you had this vaccine were worse and that this was a way of getting, helping you out, um, at least according to, um, to many European politicians um, and, and activists. And you see that, of course, when it comes to so many other technologies as well. Genetically modified crops, for example. A, a risk that we don't even know that it's there suddenly weighs heavier than the immediate obvious risk of, of dying because of, uh, of hunger. Uh, so if you end up in those bizarre results, it tells you that you're guided by the wrong principles. And uh, to keep with this theme, another question from the audience, uh, Jerry asks about, uh, a marketing question, uh, safe rather than more safe goes to the core issue that gets ignored. Although the industrial revolution has created problems, life expectancy has doubled and people have the highest quality of life known to man. How do we sell this better? Um, uh, maybe quickly, Patrick, and then Johan, um, if, we're, if we're being sold fake catastrophes, how do we better sell the real thing? Well, Kent, the, the precautionary principle is not a principle. That's really the problem. Uh, it, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning if you wanted a risk-free life. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't, I don't know how you would even think about having a risk-free life because life is risky. Uh, risk ends when you die. And that is just a fact. And so the precautionary approach does make sense though because when you come to the curb, you look both ways to see if anybody is coming in a car to, that would kill you if you stepped out there. Then you look both ways again. Then you step out to cross the street and a jet plane comes out of the sky and kills you in the middle of the street. So you have followed the precautionary approach, but there are inevitable risks that you cannot see, cannot predict that can happen. So it makes no sense to take a, a, a kind of totalitarian approach to the idea of, of being cautious. We just have to make sure we do our due diligence before we go into something. And that's why they have all these trials for medicines is to make sure, and they're double blind and all of that, they're very well thought out. We're not doing that for climate change. We're not doing that for whether or not there is a giant Pacific garbage patch which is totally fake thing that and the reason they get away with it is because people can't see the middle of the Pacific Ocean with their own eyes. And you, you'd think someone would have done this in the media now is to fly over the Pacific Ocean and show people that there is no Pacific garbage patch. But they, they're all bought into that story because it fulfills a fundraising purpose for them for at all those levels I talked about, activists, media, politicians, and scientists. And so no, nobody comes out. I mean, you'd think there'd be a giant committee of people with knowledge that would come out and say, look, there is no Pacific garbage patch. Why is it up to me to show that in my book where, where I have a, a composite photograph of the entire Pacific Ocean with no clouds because they take it all you know, one, one picture at a time and there's, it's always not cloudy somewhere. They put those together and show you a composite satellite photo of the Pacific Ocean, and there is no Pacific garbage patch. You can even see the smaller Hawaiian islands, and they are definitely not twice the size of Texas. And so it's easy to prove that it's fake, but nobody is doing it because everybody who is presenting us with electronic media has skin in the game in terms so, of convincing us that these fake things exist. Johan, you get into some... Uh evolutionary biology. You even share in your, your book um, uh, your wife's reaction to finding out that you're a, a couple percent Neanderthal. Um, are, are we hardwired to care more about the 
concerns and crises of, of Greta Thunberg than the uh, warm-hearted optimism of, of Julian Simon and Steven Pinker and, and, uh, and Matt Ridley and others? What, what uh, yes, do we I do think... about that? Back to Jerry's question. What do we do about that? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we are. And um, by the way, my wife actually expected me to be a bit more Neanderthal than the test. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I think that it comes from our past. And to change it, we have to understand it. Uh, we're pre-wired to react in certain ways, but we're not uh, hardwired. We can change that default setting. Um, so, so for example, yes, we've... Uh, you would think, it, I think it's a great question, why doesn't it sell itself, the fact that, I mean, for 200, in just 200 years, we've increased life expectancy from 30 to more than 70 years, reduced extreme poverty from around 90% to around 9% today. It should sell itself, but it doesn't because we just take progress for granted. And uh, actually, uh, your colleague, uh, Ryan Young, wrote a nice review of my book on the CI blog, and he actually expressed it better than I did. So I wish I'd seen this before and put it into my book. And he put it something like this, that we've evolved this trait to take all the good things for granted because mother nature is a superb economist. We don't have an unlimited attention span. So we have evolved ways to economize. So when things are going well, we just leave them alone. We don't think about it and save our scarce attention for dealing with threats. So we're wired to pay attention to all the possible threats that are out there. And then media and activists and politicians can use this to hijack our brain because nowadays not every threat is a threat to our survival the way it was once upon a time. Now it could be a hypothetical threat or it could be on the other side of the planet, but we might react in the same way. So, but again, we are pre-wired to react like that, but we're not hardwired. I mean, it's like um, we're pre-wired to eat all the, the sugar and salt that we see because we think um, pizza and, and beer is in bloom only for a few days and we need all of it right now. Um, but we're not hardwired to do that. We can learn about how our body functions, how, why it's worthwhile with exercise and so on. And we can do the same thing when it comes to these threats and when it comes to uh, this progress, to teach people about and teach ourselves about this progress, that the world is not a zero sum game, that innovation is the thing that saves us and to put the threats into perspective. Uh, but this comparison with the diet kind of gives it away. It is an uphill battle. We constantly have to struggle against it because it's within ourselves, this, this attention to any scare story. And, and can that be extrapolated? Uh, any successful open society has within itself the, the ingredients of its own collapse, of its own uh, dropping of the gates. Uh, do, do I read that correctly in your book? Or is that only how it's happened, but not necessarily how it will happen in the future? That's right. And that's my reading of history. Uh, again, we've had a series of or thousands of years of uh, at least brief effervescences of rapid uh, change, improvement, uh, scientific uh, growth, but they've been cut short. And um, the historian Arnold Toynbee once put it uh, in, in an excellent way, I think. He said that, look, we always talk about cultures are getting old or they um, they just lost steam. We compare it to uh, the human lifespan, but there's no DNA there in history and cultures. Uh, they don't die of age just because they've been there for a long time. No, Toynbee said, cultures only die from two things. It's murder or it's suicide. And most often it's suicide. And uh, that's, that's my political program to try to avoid us committing suicide because that's what we do when we lose cultural and economic self-confidence so that we retreat behind walls, behind barriers, behind regulation, behind strong men and big governments, because then, then we really lose steam because then we lose this ability to push onwards. I, I'm going to change uh, gears just for a moment uh, because 
I can see the linkage and I hope we can make it. Uh, Patrick, I want to ask you about uh, nuclear power, uh, not only because I want the audience to learn about your writing on this topic, but because it's going to set me up for my next question for Johan. Uh, so just tell me, is the primary reason we don't have more nuclear power the uh, alarmism that is driven by the anti-nuclear uh, war, anti-nuclear weapon community? Or is it more what you've described as people don't understand it? It's distant, it's invisible, it's hard, hard for people to get their arms around it, therefore they're fearful of it. It seems to me that uh, more nuclear power would be a very clear step forward for many societies when it comes to uh, widespread economical energy sources. And that's a massive topic, of course. There are 440 operating nuclear reactors in the world today, 96 of them in the United States, which has the most operating reactors, but has not kept building them because of the anti-nuclear movement. Radiation is invisible and the no threshold linear hypothesis that any amount of radiation is harmful has been put into all the legislation in many of the Western countries when it is a lie because there is a threshold for everything. Uh, table salt, for example, is an essential nutrient but five tablespoons of it will kill you. So, and then in between there's what you need or what starts harming you. And the same thing is true of radiation. So we know how to control the radiation issue in nuclear. The other thing is they make a big deal about nuclear accidents that didn't kill anybody. Three Mile Island and Fukushima being the two most important. Only Chernobyl caused death to people. And most of those were the people fighting the week long fire that occurred afterwards in a flawed reactor design that will never be built again. And no other style of nuclear reactor can do what Chernobyl did, which was basically a slow nuclear bomb. The other aspect is that back in the day when nuclear war really was a day-to-day -day threat, we lumped nuclear energy in with nuclear weapons as if all nuclear was evil. We should have included nuclear energy in with nuclear medicine as a beneficial use of nuclear technology. And the most important point though, well, two most important points. Number one, nuclear energy could do more to replace the precious fossil fuels that will not last forever than any other technology with reliable cost-effective electricity 24 seven. All the only reason they have to stop is to refuel every couple of years. And you can plan for that to happen called a planned outage. Whereas wind and solar have unplanned outages practically every day. And the other main point is that it is not nuclear waste. The used nuclear fuel from nuclear reactors still has more than 90% of the potential energy in it. And if you look on your search engine for Russia, BN-800, big nuclear-800, you will see that they are already building fast neutron reactors on the Caspian Sea, commercial reactors producing electricity for the citizens and the industries with used nuclear fuel. This used nuclear fuel should be stored and guarded carefully as it will provide hundreds of more years of energy than what it did during its first fueling. So people should stop calling it nuclear waste, call it used nuclear fuel, or fuel for the future would be a good name for it because that's what it is. And if we could, could lengthen the time that the fossil fuels last for critical aspects like flying in an airplane, for example, you can't plug an airplane into an electric switch. Whereas you can with everything that is stationary, all buildings could be run on nuclear electricity. That is 40% of the energy consumption of the United States. Everything stationary, in factories, electric arc furnaces for recycling steel, all the electric motors and pumps in factories, all shipping could be nuclear powered as are five nuclear navies and the whole of the Russian icebreaker fleet today. So if you can go underwater in a submarine with 100 nuclear missiles for three months on nuclear propulsion, you can run oil tankers and cargo ships 
on nuclear propulsion, every single one of them. And then there's all the trains. There's a lot of trains that are not electrified. They could all be electrified. And the huge shovels in open pit mines can be tethered to electricity. The trucks can't because they have to go up out in to, to the mill with their load of ore with a huge diesel engine. That's what we should be saving the fossil fuels for. Johan, let me ask you, um, because you, you explore so well, uh, and, it, and it reads like a narrative. Uh, like, like Again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but at certain points with each of these books, I felt like I was reading a novel and I was engaged with characters and really large agents, uh, forces of history, uh, more recent history with Patrick's and, and kind of the scope of humankind with your own book. Um, you talk about trade and exchange. There's commercial trade with goods, there's the trade of ideas and technologies and knowledge. And uh, you tell the story of Genghis Khan and how he adopted as adopted technologies as he moved across the steps. Uh, it's trade in genetics, and that makes us uh, hardier and, and, and better off. What is it that keeps us from trading uh, the evidence of technologies that work? And here again, Nuclear power has a long track record of being uh, safe and economical. Uh, we have strong demands to change the fleet of power production across the world, across America, away from uh, fossil fuel intensive uh, energy production. Why is that knowledge not transferring? It seems to me there's something missing. There's a block of some sort and, and I don't quite understand. Yes, not all ideas travel well because they come up against um, certain opposition. Um, I think, first of all, to return to the, um, the evolutionary narrative, I think it's important to realize that innovation is something quite dangerous to most people, to all of us. It's really an acquired taste uh, because in our past, uh, even though Innovation was the thing that uh, better tools, um, better ways of farming was the kind of thing that helped us along. It was also a threat because um, when innovation is always risky and most of the time innovation fails and people who live on the margins might not be able to afford any kind of risk. So if the tribal lands barely feed you, someone who comes up with a different way of using the seeds and wants to rotate the crops in an unfamiliar way, it might possibly succeed and then feed you all, all better. But why would you take that chance if failure equals starvation? So there's this inbuilt fear of innovation among uh, most of us. And, and often the successes often came because we someone just stumbled onto a better way of doing things. And we noticed that that's better and we imitated it and we were all uh, better off. Uh, nowadays then, it, we, we still carry that kind of, of uh, fear uh, towards some certain technologies and GMOs and nuclear power. Uh, they're, they're part of it. I, I think it's partly the fact that it's incredibly difficult for the average person to understand these technologies. It just, it seems like magic and magic is a, is a dangerous uh, thing. And then we have activist groups who take advantage of that. Uh, it could be for fundraising purposes. It could be because they have not really a save the nature passion always, but more of an aesthetic agenda, more of an almost religious-based agenda about what kind of society that they would like to see. Um, there's one more thing about nuclear power that I would add, and I think that it was the rollout of nuclear power at first, and Patrick pointed out some problems, partly with branding, uh, but another one was that for a short period of time, in the, the 60s and 70s, Western governments just said that this is the way to do it now. So let's just use the taxpayer money and the government oriented research and do it. And this is often what people say that we should do when we've come up with a, um, the next best thing. But that creates problems. One of the problems was that perhaps it wasn't too early 
rollout of a certain way of doing it, a premature technology. Had this been based more on the market and smaller scale incremental improvements, it would have been possible to solve many of the problems, turn it more into a routine business that would have both lowered prices, but also had an even better safety record than we had. So I think it's, it's, it's also an, a lesson in how not to roll out new technologies. Uh, don't look to the strongman to do it, look to, to the market. You, you've just touched on something that is, um, it's a topic that I worry a great deal about now, uh, today. Uh, you know, government coming and saying, just do it and do it this way. Uh, and I wonder if, if each of you could speak briefly to the question of green protectionism. Uh, we have a new president here in the United States. President Biden has, uh, seems to be taking his trade policies uh, and marrying them to the uh, ambassadorial role that John Kerry will be playing, where he travels around the world telling people how they must regulate energy for the good of the environment. And uh, that would, you know, ab absent these diplomatic and trading partners getting on board with John Kerry's view, it means we'll have less trade, more expensive goods, and uh, their model of environmental uh, stewardship, which I think will make us all poorer and worse off. Is, is this something that you see cropping up as a potential threat uh, policy on the policy level, Patrick, I know you're in Canada, Johan, you, um, you travel extensively based in Europe. Am I out, out to lunch on this green protectionism problem? Uh, not at all, Kent. Uh, Canada's on the same path as the United States. I think we preceded you with voting in our child prime minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, who has, in my estimation at least, proven to be a total disaster. Uh, he, he's, he has spent more money without a budget than any prime minister ever in the history of Canada in the last two years. And, 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 and it's basically much of it is wasted. Uh, and the same thing is going to happen in the United States as far as I can see. Johan, you, you made a brilliant point about innovation. Uh, we have this saying, you stick with what's tried and true. And, and that, that is, I think, hardwired into us as individuals and as cultures. Uh, but I have to say about nuclear energy, it has actually a 100% record of safety in the United States with starting out with about 104 nuclear reactors. There's only about 100 and, uh, sorry, about 96 running now, I believe, as some have come of age. There's never been a civilian injured by nuclear energy in the United States. And you can't say that for gas and oil and coal. I mean, there's, there's, there's been fires and oil rigs blowing up and that sort of thing and pipelines blowing up with fossil fuels because they have that potential. Uh, the, the, again, the Chernobyl accident, which those, those reactors, the, the, that, that class of reactor were built behind the Iron Curtain before the West had any influence on what Russia was doing in nuclear technology. And they choose the reactors that they were making their plutonium for nuclear weapons and cookie cuttered them all over the former Soviet Union as commercial power reactors. And they should never have done that. It, it was a huge mistake. It's amazing that more of them didn't blow up, but that one at Chernobyl did and was a, a very expensive lesson. On the other hand, more people have died in one hydroelectric accident in Russia than in the whole of the history of the nuclear industry. It's like 56, and they were all at Chernobyl. So people have got to stop being afraid of nuclear energy because it is one of the safest technologies we have ever devised. And part of the reason for that is because of radiation and the fact that it is dangerous if people get too much of it. And it's been very carefully controlled in nuclear reactors so that people haven't been harmed by it. Johan, yeah, I'd I, love to get your thought on this uh, uh, green protectionism, especially in light of the EU and uh, our previous conversation, the, the way the EU has come down on a life-saving set of processes that we know as 
the production of GMO foods. Um, is green protectionism a real threat or, or am, I, am I being driven by fear that's unnecessary? Um, we all are, but uh, sometimes <laughs> the fear is actually motivated. Uh, let me just say for the record, Patrick, I absolutely agree. And I think that uh, outside the, with the exception of communist Soviet Union, I think more people have been hurt at anti-nuclear power demonstrations than <laughs> from nuclear power. Um, so that's really some uh, a lesson we should we should take. Uh, green protectionism is on the rise in several places. We have the same thing in the European Union right now. Governments here are debating a uh, tax, a carbon tax border adjustment, as they call it, which really is. Um, well, the same old economic strategy of raising your competitors costs. <laughs> so if you implement costs back home, you want to raise it for, for others as well. And this is bad in so many ways. One obvious problem is that it will hurt the, um, it will hurt free trade generally, it will hurt trading relationships. Others have other um, systems and institutions and uh, they will be forced to pay more we don't know how much there, there are no real proposals out there yet uh, but th that will stay start trade wars and that's incredibly dangerous in itself because as i point out in my book trade is the most important means we have of increasing our wealth and our opportunities and it's the best way of protecting the planet as well because it's also a way to constantly make sure that the best production processes the ones that used uh, less resources or less energy that they are they can compete with others that have to have more inefficient processes so i think this is bad in every single way but it's also counterproductive in a in a in another way how do you do that how do you take uh, a a product like a a cell phone or a uh, computer or even um, a shirt at the border and decide so how much greenhouse gases has gotten into this production because it's made up of inputs from an intermediate goods from different continents. There's no way, it's a bureaucratic nightmare to try to look at every individual step of, of that production chain. So they're not gonna do that. They're just gonna have a, a, a average guess. This is how much greenhouse gases goes into the production of an average cell phone or shirt, and then just take, force them to pay that at the border. And what does that mean? Well, it means that no producer anywhere has an incentive to improve the greenery of their own production because they'll be forced to pay the same thing at the border. So it's not even a green incentive while ruining um, free trade around the world as well. So this is really something to be afraid of. I see what we're running up against time in just a moment here. So I'm gonna ask you each uh, to incorporate maybe closing thoughts or, or summary thoughts into the, into the following question. Um, and I wanna flip the script on each of you for just a moment. Um, Johan, much of your book is an extended case for the notion of open. Uh, and Patrick, you argue against fake catastrophes. So let me ask you, uh, Patrick, what's a concise summary of what you're for? What is it we need more of? And then subsequently, Johan, what is it that you would like to see less of in the world? Kent, I think we need more carbon dioxide. And the vilification of carbon dioxide will be the downfall of the Western economies, the Western democracies, if it is carried out the way people are saying they're going to do it. Carbon dioxide is the main food for all life on earth, on land and in the sea. It is at a low point in terms of its historical abundance in the atmosphere and in the oceans because they are in equilibrium with each other. The ocean gets its carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And if we don't recognize this soon, we will impoverish ourselves without, I mean, the other, the real problem is 40% of the population on earth is in China, India, and Russia, and they are not doing this. Yes, they are building lots of new nuclear plants like we should be too, but they are not limiting their fossil fuel consumption. 
China now burns as much coal as the rest of the world put together, and they have no intention of stopping the increase. They say they're going to do it in 2060. That is just flim flam. And, and for some reason, the Western economies, I don't know whether they believe it or whether what they what maybe don't care about it or think that we'll be better off if we reduce 80% of our energy down to net zero. Uh, it would be the, the decimation of Western civilization to end the use of fossil fuels, which provide 80% of our energy today. The nuclear solution is important. It, it is the only technology that could radically reduce fossil fuel consumption. Wind and solar will never ever do that. Look at Germany. They haven't reduced their CO2 emissions by more than a few percent. And they've spent billions on wind and solar energy. It doesn't work for reducing CO2 emissions. It, it doesn't work period. So the vilification of carbon dioxide is the primary disease of the Western mind and must be cured. I, I want uh, our audience to, to note, when you pick up Patrick's book, uh, it's extensively noted, footnoted, and uh, more so than any book I've read recently, full of charts to help you visualize some of the things that he's talking about here, like the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere over uh, the millennia. Uh, Patrick, thank you. And let me turn to Johan and ask you uh, again to flip the script on, you, on the narrative of your book. Uh, what is it that you'd like to see uh, less of? I'd like to see less certainty. And uh, I'd like to see less of people knowing that they have the answer to uh, what's going to happen next, uh, whether it be um, how to deal with economic problems or environmental problems or uh, how to generally encourage better society, uh, because that's the thing that leads us to uh, devoting all our time, energy, efforts, resources to one particular solution. And that's really a way of uh, cutting us off from all the experimentation that we need. Um, so less top down certainty and more openness to surprises. That's the thing that I read in from, from history. All the great things that we now love and cherish from um, the big things like the vaccines, our uh, energy systems, to the small things. I mean, even things like uh, the, the umbrella or uh, particular uh, the clothes or furniture was always seen as worthless originally before they had been tested large scale, uh, worthless or impossible or dangerous. And it was only because we had open societies that said, okay, allow that small minority of crazy people to experiment with this idea and see if they can get some funding, some fans, some customers. And then with trial and error and incremental changes, it became the modern world. And, uh, and the problem right now is that I'm seeing lots of certainty from different sides. They're, they have their one solution and they want to shove it down our throats. And that's the way to cut off any kind of open-ended, unpredictable progress uh, that we need to keep our civilization going. It's a, it's a wonderful testament to knowledge as a discovery process. So thank you for those closing words. Uh, again, everyone, uh, Johan's latest book is open. Uh, this has been a really lovely conversation with each of you. Thank you for carving out time. I want to remind everyone that our next event will be a policy forum. It's on April the 14th, and we'll look into a recent report of a governmental task force investigating the CFPB. I'll be joined by CEI senior fellow John Burlau, Kyle Houtman, a regulator and the vice chairman at the National Credit Union Administration, and the task force chairman and CEI board member, Professor Todd Zwicky. I want you to look for details in your inbox next week or at our website, cei.org, where you will also find this program available to share with your friends. In the meantime, thank you all for joining us. And don't forget to tell us what you think. We have a short survey. I think it's four questions, and it will appear automatically as we log off. Good day to you all. Thank you, Kent.